Welcome to the Sports Scouting Report Podcast with Lee Brickeen. Three, two, one. We're taping. Welcome to the Sports Scouting Report with Lee Burkeen. Uh, today's show will be about our recap of the college football week and also a little bit about pro football. And uh, I'm also going to have a segment about the top receivers in Louisiana. We weren't able to do that last week because we our, our interview went over. But I'm going to go ahead and get into our first topic, which is uh, recapping college football. Um, which was our really the first full week of games. Let's face it, it felt like football for the first time, don't we? Do I get that uh, agreement from my listeners? It just felt like the first week of normalcy with football. I watched a lot of games. I watched Kansas. That was tough to watch. It actually made me go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> uh, Les Miles, the offense looks like Les Miles' offense at LSU. You know, very conservative, run, run, pass, um, pass, run, run, punt. You know, so they lost to Coastal Carolina, which was an NAI school not too long ago. Two years in a row, Kansas has lost to Coastal Carolina. Let me tell you something. They got some good-looking players. They got a pro prospect quarterback at Coastal Carolina. Two defensive ends that can play in the NFL, could play for LSU or Alabama or Florida or Georgia. Uh, But they had no business beating a Kansas in the Big 12. I mean, wow. The recruiting has not been really good for Les Miles at Kansas. Uh, He's not recruiting as well as he did at Oklahoma State and LSU. It's just the brand is not at that level. It's not even at Kansas State level. It's going to be tough for for Les to turn it around. I mean, it's not looking good. Um, You know, first year you get a pass, second year, you know, you kind of get a pass, and your third year you're looking to see improvement. You don't want to lose to a team that's basically was an NAI team, you know, as as many as like maybe three, four years ago. And let's go ahead and turn our attention to ULL, the Raging Cajuns. I watched the whole game against Iowa State. Let me tell you something. If you're not a ULL fan, you don't have to be. To watch that game, and I've been watching ULL off and on since 1981. I've seen some teams that had Jake DeLome, Brandon Stokely. They beat A&M. Actually, I heard the A&M game on the radio. That was their biggest upset. This is their best ranking since, like, I think 1976 to be ranked 19th. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for the Cajuns and Lafayette. Big deal for their alumni and their fan base. You know, they've had teams that have had great DBs and great receivers and great linemen, but they've never really had a really great defense overall. But take your hat off to Billy Napier because he has went out there and found players through junior college, through D1 transfers, and also through recruiting really good high school players and developing these guys and getting some good op-out. He's got some good some good transfers. Um that have opted out and, and, and transferred to his team. They've got two NFL running backs, Elijah Mitchell, from, uh, which is a great back from ERAF High School that I watched play in high school. They got a young back, Smith, out of Mississippi that took that uh, kickoff, what, almost 100 yards for touchdown. They've got a great pump return. They've got a great special teams, man. And their D-line, Talon Humphrey, is an NFL first-round pick. The guy's 6'5", 360, runs like a five-flat. He just takes on three blockers every play. He's phenomenal. There's not a Talon Humphrey at LSU. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right now. The guy's a freak. And he's uh, came from a junior college out of Kansas. Billy Napier brought him in. He's developed a team. He lost a little bit of weight. The offensive line at UL is legit. Most of those kids are from Louisiana, and I I was high on all of them. Two of them are from Neville High School. One is uh, out of St. Helena Central. They're all going to be in the NFL. If UL gets better quarterback play out of Levi Lewis, if if Levi can go to the next level with his arm, UL could be – they could go undefeated. With this defense and special teams and that offensive line and those running backs – 
Iowa State's got a good team. It was at Iowa State. They got a top 25 program. Iowa State, Coach Campbell's one of the best young coaches in America. They beat them. They, they didn't just beat them. They just they manhandled them. So, you know, when I watch football, when you when you win the trenches in the O and D line, you can win every game, especially when you're in the Sun Belt and you've got that kind of talent. But, again, if they can get good quarterback play out of Levi Lewis, who I'm a big fan of since Scotlandville High School when he played in Baton Rouge. He's nothing, you know, no one's ever – Discounted Levi's ability to run and, and, you know, scramble around the pocket. He's a great athlete. He's just got to learn to get that, that short passing game down. And they've got the receivers, too. But, you know, the tight ends, they got three big tight ends that can block. I mean, this is a heck of a team. They're deserving of that 19th ranking right now, and it's the, it's the highest ranking, I think, since 1976. Go Cajuns, man. And a lot of these guys are from Louisiana. Some are from Mississippi, Alabama. Texas, Georgia. Hey, take your hat off to Billy Napier and that staff. Let's move on to Tulane. Tulane had a really, I thought, an off game, kind of sluggish, kind of out of sync against South Alabama. I watched that game. Tulane was playing at South Alabama. South Alabama's got some good receivers. If you watch the game, they've got three pro receivers at South Alabama. They got a good little quarterback. He's not an NFL guy, but he, he, he can get the ball to the receivers. And they got a pretty good OD line. But Tulane did not play very well. And that, that goes to show you Tulane has turned things around when you don't play well and you still win on the road. And it's week one. It's the first game. It's the first game. You're not going to be your best. You're going to be a little sluggish. You're going to be a little off. Quarterback's not going to be timing with his receivers as well. Linemen are going to be a little out of shape. They're trying to get back into game shape. You know, your running backs are not going to be as crisp. You know, hitting the holes with their vision. You know, everything. Even coaches in sync. But they still won the game, even though they were down by two touchdowns for most of the game. Take your hat off for Tulane for gutting it out, for just, you know, competing and just hanging in there and doing what they needed to do to get the W. That's the difference with this staff. At Tulane, they 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 don't they don't quit. They fight, and uh, they got good players. And they got two NFL defensive ends. They got two NFL running backs. They got a good offensive line. I'm impressed with the true freshman, Renovich from Holy Cross, the offensive guard. He's going to be a heck of a player. He's a true freshman. I thought he was phenomenal, starting his first game. To move on, um, I thought Notre Dame, even though they didn't look good on TV. It's week one. Duke's got a decent team. Duke's the, Duke needs a quarterback, even though they got the kid from Clemson, Chase Bryce. He's, he's you know, solid. But you can tell he doesn't have the Clemson guys around him. And so Notre Dame always gets better as the season goes on, kind of like an LSU or an Oklahoma or a Texas or an Alabama or a Florida, Georgia. So a lot of people might say Notre Dame looked bad, but Notre Dame's young and talent, and they got a heck of a quarterback. That kid is a Houdini in the pocket for Notre Dame. He can work the pocket better than anybody in the country this year. He's hard to sack. You flush him, he runs all over you. If you, if you, if you stand back and don't rush him, he kills you with the short game. And Notre Dame's got great backs. They've got great receivers. They've got great D linemen, O linemen, and linebackers. They're going to be a top 10 team. But, you know, Duke's not a bad program with David Cutcliffe. They just need a quarterback. Duke could have won that game. Florida State, they played hard. And I'm going to say something. Georgia Tech has a good team. They have a good team, and they've got a good coach. Golf Collins is a good coach. And they've got a lot of talent. And so Georgia Tech, this might be their most talented team in a decade, and they had five starters out. And Florida State played hard. Marvin Wilson, who LSU tried to get a few years ago from Texas, the D-tackle, he's really impressed me on how good he's become at Florida State. He's going to be a first-round pick. Florida State needs a quarterback. They really do. The kid that's you know back this year, he hasn't improved much. He still doesn't make good decisions in the pocket when you rush him. And watching that Florida State game, Georgia Tech just basically outplayed them in the trenches. And outworked them. But, but Florida State did play with some toughness, which they didn't do in the past, you know, since Bobby Bowden. 
uh, in Jimbo, you know, the first two years of Jimbo Fisher. But, you know, Florida State's not looking bad. I mean, but, but Georgia Tech, give them credit. They're a really good team. And Florida State's not the old Florida State. Again, they need a quarterback. You know, around the, around the country, not everybody did play. Texas didn't play anybody yet, so they weren't really challenged yet. Oklahoma, we don't know how good their new quarterback's going to be because they haven't, they haven't played anybody yet. And we'll see how it all shakes out. The SEC will play in under two weeks with LSU and the Georgias, the Floridas, the Alabamas, the Auburns, the Mississippi States. We'll see how the ACC does. I don't, I'm not impressed overall with the ACC and the Big 12. Big 12 is really looking bad. Basically, whoever wins the Texas-Oklahoma game will probably be a playoff team. I mean, that conference is really weak, you know, outside of Texas, Oklahoma. You know, even Kansas State might be the third best team in that conference, which is crazy. Because Oklahoma State's down. Iowa State looked bad. TCU's not the old TCU. Even though we haven't seen them play yet, I just don't think they're where they were. Kansas is not going to be in the pitch drop, so they're going to be lucky to win a game. I'm going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the top receivers in the state of Louisiana. Let's have some fun. We'll be right back. Hello, Louisiana Football Magazine fans. Like what you're hearing? Well, you're going to love our content at LAFootballMagazine.com. This week, make sure to check out Recruit Spotlight articles on Lakeshore linebacker Devin Wellbaker Northwood lineman Cameron Foster, South Terrebonne athlete Kobe Chalette, and Scoutonville, as well as Michigan State defensive back commit Javon Grigsby. Also, make sure to go to our website to order or North and South magazine editions for the upcoming 2020 season. All that and more at LAFootballMagazine.com. Welcome back. You listen to the Sports Scouting Report with Leaper Keen. I thought we should have some fun today and talk about who I think are the top receivers in the state by watching these kids play last year in the last two or three years, some of them four years. I don't go by rankings. I go by who can play. I've been doing this for about 30 years um, and um, got a pretty good eye for it uh, since we've started the magazine with all the recruiting information that I've put in there from going to games. But let me throw out our, the best receivers. Everybody knows about Brian Thomas at Walker, who's uncommitted. He'll probably end up at Alabama or LSU. And I think it'll be LSU in the end. He's a great, great kid. Reminds me of Michael Clayton that played at LSU that was at Christian Life High School. Was a great player. That type of build. Jack Besh, I think, is the best receiver in the country that's not in the top 150. I think he's a national 100 player. I think he's one of the top five receivers in the country because he is aggressive. He's got a big body. And he runs like a receiver, has the tight end size. And you're not going to out-effort him, and he's going to out-tough you for the ball. And that's what I think. I think he'll be a, a 50 to 70 catch receiver in college. If he does go to Vanderbilt, where he's committed, he'll catch 60, 70 passes. Because he can run routes, he's got great hands, and he's going to out-muscle everybody in the SEC. Especially if, you, if he's in the slot at six foot two, 210, 215, he's going to just... You're not going to be able to guard him. A linebacker will not be able to guard Jack Besh in college. And that's the SEC, the Big 12, you name it, Pac-12, whatever. He's going to be phenomenal. I hope he ends up at L- I hope LSU makes a run on him because it's hard to find a big body receiver that you can't guard in the slot. We saw that with Moss this past year. Um, and then you've got Tyrese Johnson, who I like, from Booker T. Washington in New Orleans. I think Tyrese is – not getting the due that he deserves. He's fast, tall, physical, about 6'1", 200 pounds, and can really go. He runs like he's 180, 6'5", you know, 10", one of those guys. But he's a big-bodied receiver who can go play, I think, anywhere. Um, and then there's Chris Hilton, who uh, is committed to LSU. Great track guy that's become a football player at Zachary. And Chris, what I like about Chris Hilton, he's, he's about 6'1", about 180 now. Chris is smart, and when the game is on the line, throw out what, what he runs. He does run a 4-4. He does have the 40, almost 39, 38-inch vertical jump. He's a long jumper, all-state guy in track. 
he is going to take the game into his hands when the game's on the line. And just ask West Monroe two years ago. You know, third and whatever, 10, 15 on their own five, he catches this 80-yard pass and just, and then he gets in the end zone. You know, he does it all. If the game is on the line, he wants the ball. That's the kind of guy that I want to sign in football. Not just that he's 6'1", 180, and runs a 4'4". A lot of guys, not many, but, you know, for a guy that, that you want to separate those guys, Chris Hilton, he wants the ball when the game's on the line. And then there's Glenn Johnson from Lake Charles Prep. Uh, I don't know to confirm if he's still at Lake Charles Prep since the storm, and I want to mention my prayers to everybody in Lake Charles, Westlake, Sulphur, you know, that whole Lake Charles area that was just, it, it makes me sad to look at the pictures and to talk to people that I know from Lake Charles, uh, recruits that I know, recruits' dads, people that I know that played football at LSU and McNeese, our prayers are with you, and, and I've been praying for the city of Lake Charles in that whole area, Westlake Sulphur, you know, all the way to Leesville. Alexandria was hit hard. Um, Shreveport got a lot of, lot of wind, too, but I'm praying for all the people that were affected in the state um, from the storm. And, uh, but, but Glenn Johnson, if he's still at Lake Charles Prep, you know, wherever he's going to be this coming year is one of the best receivers in the state. He's 5'10", about 170. He's got that Beckham type of game where he can just wiggle and cut and, and run and stop, and he's always just more athletic than everybody that he plays. And he, he can get up in the air for a guy that's only like 5'10 and a half. And then there's Destin Pazon from Edna Carr, who's really, really athletic. Six foot, about 185, very strong been playing for three years for Edna Carr and can catch the ball, and he can fly. He's a 4-4 legit. Not many of those. His hands, once his hands become phenomenal, he's got good hands. I think he could be a pro receiver in, in the NFL. He could also be a cornerback in college if he wanted to be. And then, and then let's keep going with receivers. Darren Perry from North Louisiana, a plain dealing, I think is a big-time receiver. He's just – you know, a little light, 160, 6'1", but he'll fill out. DJ Jacobs from Washita High School, I think's a phenomenal player. He's a D1 guy, six foot, 195. Samaji Tennant from Bastrop, 6'4", 190. Man, this kid caught almost 90 passes last year for Bastrop. He's a guy to keep an eye on. I think he's got an NFL future if he keeps progressing. Ty, Tay Gaden from Mangum, 6'2", 180, a big-time Big-time talent. His uncle, Kenny Bell, played for Alabama, if you remember Kenny Bell. Um, and, and Adrian Green from Mansfield's a big-time uh, receiver that runs 4-4-5, 4-4-0. A track guy learning to become a really good football player. You know, and also Jacoby Connor, another kid from Washita, 6'4", 190. I really like his upside. He's not even up to where he needs to be yet. I mean, he's got so much upside to show his senior year at Washita. Those are some of the top receivers that I've seen play in 19 and 2018, and some of these guys were starting in 2017. But I hope you enjoyed that segment. We're going to take a break. When we come back real quickly, I'm going to talk about the Saints and uh, Joe Burrow, Cincinnati Bengals. We'll be right back. Parents, are you looking for advice on getting your high school athlete recruited by the right college? Lee Brakeen is your answer. Lee has been doing it for over 30 years. He knows the ropes, and more importantly, he knows the people. Lee offers turnkey service from evaluation, creating highlight tapes in the correct format, and complete guidelines for effective communication with the schools. No matter the sport, girl or boy, no matter what grade your child is in, let Lee Brakeen help match your child to the right college fit. Go to our website, LAFootballMagazine.com, and get connected today. Welcome back. You're listening to Sports Scouting Report. A little pro recap. The Saints beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Here's my thought process. The Saints will be a good football team because they beat Tampa Bay and they didn't play a perfect game. It is week one. Brady made two big-time mistakes, threw a pick six, 
had another interception. But let's let's face it. When Gronk, Fournette, Brady, Devin White, OJ, the tight end, when all these guys, OJ Howard, when all these guys become one and are on the same page, I think Tampa Bay's upside's bigger than the Saints upside in the end. I just think the Saints have a more experienced team. They took that game. That game could have went either way still, even though, you know, there's a couple of mistakes there by Tom. But I think Tampa Bay is going to be tougher to beat the second go-around than in the first game. The Saints have a chance to be really good. It all depends on Drew staying healthy. And they need Kamar to be the guy that, that he was two years ago. Unstoppable. They need their run game to be unstoppable to take the pressure off of Drew. If it becomes too much Drew, then they won't be able to get to the Super Bowl. It's got to be balanced. they got to have a great year from Kamar. they got to stay healthy on the D-line and O-line. They do have a good defense, and I was really impressed how they played against Tampa Bay, who's got tons of weapons. O.J. Howard, like I said, Fournette. You know, they've got guys that are third team that are former All-Pro players. Tom Brady. You know, Gronk, you know, just their, their, tough, their offensive line's pretty good. Joe Burrow, I think, is going to be a phenomenal pro football quarterback. Um, if the kicker makes that kick at the end and doesn't miss the chip shot 31 yard field goal, then, then uh, Cincinnati's probably playing to win that game because you got to give the overtime win to the home team. That's usually wh- who wins it, whoever's at home, even though there's no fans. <laughs> um, but. In the NFL, I thought there were some great games. I was impressed with Russell Gage from LSU catching about eight or nine balls at his record amount as a pro. He's going to be a good receiver for Atlanta. Obviously, Devin White and Deion Jones are two of the top linebackers in the NFL, both from LSU, Deion Jones with Atlanta Falcons, former Jesuit high school linebacker. And then Devin White, former um, former big-time linebacker at LSU. And, uh, you know, just – did a phenomenal job at North Webster, which used to be Spring Hill High School, um, with Tampa Bay. You know, there's a lot of great players in the NFL from LSU. Tons. Davis White, the DB for Buffalo, um, is, is one of the top corners in the NFL. And I think Jamal Adams had one of the most dominant performances I've seen from a DB in a game, in a pro game, since Mel Blunt, the Steelers. Uh, his performance against it, uh, you know, for the Seahawks was phenomenal. He took over the game for Seattle. Jamal Adams is an incredible – he's become a phenomenal safety that can blitz and rush the quarterback. He can do it all. He can do everything. It's like having an outside linebacker playing three positions for you. If you need him to guard – his strength's not guarding underneath, but he's so good blitzing the quarterback. He's so good disrupting and getting in the backfield. I mean, it's like a defensive end, but he's, 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 you know, he's a safety, but he's, he's a big safety that can fly. And he plays with so much energy. And Damian Lewis had a phenomenal first game start at guard for Seattle. He, I saw four pancakes in his first eight reps. What a man child Damian Lewis is. I mean, I knew he did it at LSU, but my goodness, when you're pancaking D tackles in the NFL, you're on your way to being a special offensive lineman. And Ethan Posick bounced back from his injury-prone rookie sophomore seasons. And he's the starting center for Seattle and doing a great job. The Chicago, Illinois native that played at LSU for the LSU Tigers. We're good. I hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to go to our website and get your South and North preview copy, LAFootballMagazine.com. And we'll see you Friday. We've got a great high school football coach We'll tell you who it is when we see you Friday. Thanks for listening to the Sports Scouting Report podcast with Lee Brookings.